Well, good morning. Welcome to the table. I'm so glad that you were with us and happy new year. Happy new year. I know that uh, a, a lot of us have not been terribly sad uh, for 2020 to end. It feels like a time uh, for to really talk about death and resurrection, which is really at the table. What this Sunday and next Sunday are going to be all about is death and resurrection, this cycle of death and resurrection. Uh, which is really the cycle of all created things. And uh, it's going to be a good time. Uh, Joel and Tosh are with us, which is always uh, just such a delight. And I'm so grateful that you're with us. And by the way, and I hope this, I, can I say this in a way that doesn't sound like some kind of a pastoral platitude or some kind of empty, weird, whatever? Seriously, good job making it into this new year. And like whether or not you feel like you kind of, limped over the finish line or sort of collapsed into it like who cares you're here and that's a really big deal so uh i'm just i really am grateful this morning and and we are live this morning by the way we are very live right now uh as i'm thinking about new beginnings and how we always get to start over and that's really what a life with god always means and what it's always about is that we get to start over from wherever we are and i hope that you'll hear that as an invitation uh, this morning, uh, that you don't have to, I don't know, that there's never some kind of sense of having to go back through some sort of remediation or whatever. We just get to start over wherever you are, whoever needs a fresh start. And for whatever reason, we get to do that right here, right now, today, not just because it's the new year, but because um, we believe in a God who actually is making all things new. So with that in view, I want to just pray for us real quick, and I'm going to kick it over to Joe, Joe and Tosh who are gonna lead us in worship. So would you pray with me? God of new beginnings, some things are coming to an end and um, some things coming to some hard ends, difficult ends, but at the same time that some things are dying, other things are coming to life. And we feel that, we feel the truth of that in our very bones. And uh, we would just invite you spirit of life to come and bring the very breath of God into our lungs today, uh, making a people where there has not been a people, where there has been nothing but dry bones, uh, that those bones would come back to life and that there'd be flesh and uh, there'd be meat on those bones and that all of a sudden there'd be a sense of, uh, of, of dreams that have long since died and uh, all kinds of ways that People have felt like giving up, but I just pray that today, that this time that we have together will be just a sense of wind in people's sails, uh, that you will meet with us, that you will rejuvenate us and restore us in whatever ways that people need to encounter you today. Uh, we know that you are here with us. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you as the very breath of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joel and Tosh, y'all know I love you. Happy New Year. Thanks so much for New being here, guys. Yeah. Happy New Year. We're happy to see you guys as we kick off the new beginning. Um, calendrically, we know this is a reset, but um, love that we get to see you guys as we do, as we as we do that. Yeah. And be with you. Yeah. It's, it's always a joy to, to worship together and to, um, to find beauty in, in the depth that is community, um, even in this way. I, I love the way that the Holy Spirit just moves um, and connects and draws us together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Doors, we love to enter in and 
your arms so true to hold me up. the thin space where the Lord is revealing the Lord's self in goodness, in trust, in faith, in patience, in justice, in righteousness, in salvation, in lifting us up. It's what we longed for, it's what we called for, it's what we cried for, prayed for, lived for, died for. 
those glimpses, moments, realizations. It's here now, living, loving, breathing in you, with you, by you, for you. This door of the Lord that is open, not just for some, not just for Christians, for every single person, Christ came, Christ died. Christ rose again. So this corridor is open for all. This space, this liminal space, I'm so thankful for it and I'm thankful for love, thankful for this community of the table of dear ones who know God's love and mercy and grace and are so willing to give it to those in need. Malik is going to guide us in a prayer now. Good morning. Oh my gosh. That was beautiful. Um, love you guys so much. So glad that you're here with us for the very first um, Sunday service of 2021. Joel and Tosh, we love you. Um, I just want to say a happy new year, everybody. We made it. Um, barely, <laughs> just a little bit, but we got here and it's a new day. And I'm personally really excited about 2021. I know that sounds crazy, but I, you know, every night has its fun. I think it's an old white snake song. <laughs> one of those songs from the 80s um but it's true you know and here we are in 2021 and what i loved about the first um like the first few moments of 2021 at least here in oklahoma city i stayed up you know at midnight it crossed over i was going to go to sleep and all of a sudden i heard this huge clap of thunder i thought something hit the house and it was this massive snowstorm and it was just breathtakingly beautiful and um I don't know about you, but it was <laughs> really funny because I don't know anybody else in Oklahoma City had this crazy thought, but it was getting really light and it was like midnight and it kept getting lighter and lighter. And it, by you know, like 1230, it was almost pink. I kept thinking, and this is where my uh, evangelical brain went, <laughs> I kept thinking, oh, it's, it's, is it over? It's like, is it? Is it judgment day? I'm confused. Why is it getting brighter outside? And my one thought, if it had been, and theologically, I'm not saying this is correct. It's just where my brain went. I kept thinking, but I'm comfortable. So that was my thought, if it had been judgment day. <laughs> I did not want to get out of bed because I was so cozy. Anyway, turned out it was just a snowstorm and the sky was casting shadows and it was beautiful. We woke up the next morning on the first and in Oklahoma City, I have never seen it so beautiful. It looked like something straight out of Narnia. I expected, you know, the white witch to come by on her little thing and it was breathtakingly beautiful and uh, it felt like a good start. The whole city was just covered in this precious beautiful snow and I kept thinking it's a new day I, for me it seemed like a sign it was a new day so all of that to say happy new year just so glad that you guys are with us um I don't know about you but the whole thing of 2020 having this community and this group of people and a table centric um community really helped me uh root myself in the things of God and and like um Beautiful Tosh said, you know, God is the God of love, the God of incarnate love, the God who would rather be here with us than anywhere else. And, um, and we have that God and we have a community of people who know that God. And in this time, God is revealing God's self. And I want to go ahead and pray. So let's pray real quick. Um, oh, Abba parent, love, spirit, child, father, son, Holy Spirit, we gather across this time and space, across the world. 
we thank you for this global community. We thank you for this local community. We thank you for Joel and Tosh in Indiana. We thank you that you are everywhere at all times. You could be with us. And that is your heart. And now we are never separated from you. Even if we think we are, we thank you. It's times like this where you reveal that you are nowhere but here. You are here at all times with us forever, always close to us, always ready to comfort us, to remind us of how much you love us, that we are the beloved and we're the beloved community. So we ask that you would be with us each day, that we take it one day at a time in 2021 and that we see your spirit move and we follow, that we seek justice, that we love radically and that we include radically. And we thank you, Lord, that you be in this community with these people, healing us, comforting those who are mourning, securing those who are afraid, and being the light of the world. And with you, we know that we will overcome. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So today is a beautiful day, first day of the year, but we want to acknowledge one thing before we go on to the scriptures, and that is our friend Cece Jones Davis, who is heading up um, the amazing campaign of justice for Julius. And we have um, a beautiful Madeline Jones and uh, Antoinette in our community and our, our, we are friends with. And um, over the last few days, the Justice for Julius campaign did an amazing thing. They did a walk for freedom and five bold activists, and I want to say their names, walked 131 miles from Oklahoma City to McAllister in the snow, in the rain, in the freezing temperatures, 131 miles from December 31st, 2020 to January 3rd, 2021. And those names are, uh, it's JB, who we love. And there is um, Ivy Rowland, Jess Eddy, Cody Bass, and then my friend, Francie. And so we just wanna say, we love you guys. We honor you guys. We thank you guys for this amazing, um, to bring attention to the wrongful arrest and wrongful conviction and wrongful sentencing of Julius Jones. And please, if you don't know about this case, go to justiceforjulius.com, watch the doc, sign the petition, uh, share on social media. We really ask that our community get involved because there's one thing um, about Oklahoma and that we are in the one or two top incarcerated, uh, incarceration for anywhere in the world. And so we want that to end and we want to look at cases like Julius that are uh, erroneous. So please check that out. We love you guys. Thank you for being here. And we're gonna go ahead and go to Mackenzie. And Mackenzie is gonna bring us the scripture for today. For today. Love you guys. Hello, hey beautiful table community. Um, it's amazing that this is the uh, first Sunday of the new year and that we're all together. And thank you, Joel and Tosh and Malika for your prayer and just opening that corridor um, for us all to enter into just the God of love, mercy and grace. And I just feel hope anew kind of um, resting on us this morning. So um, I'm gonna read scripture and it's Matthew 2, 1 through 15, 19 through 23. Um, the message version. So here we go. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, <clears throat> Judah territory, this was during Herod's kingship. A band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on a pilgrimage to worship him. When word of their in inquiry got to Herod, he was terrified and not Herod alone but most of Jerusalem as well. Herod lost no time. He gathered all the high priests and religion scholars in the city together and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They told him Bethlehem, Judah territory. The prophet Micah wrote it plainly. If you Bethlehem in Judah's land no longer bringing up the rear, from you <clears throat> will come the leader who will shepherd rule my people, my Israel. Herod then arranged a secret meeting with the scholars from the east. Pretending to be as devout as they were, he got them to tell him exactly when the birth announcement star appeared. 
<clears throat> then he told them the prophecy about Bethlehem and said, go find this child, leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, send word and I'll join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. Then the star appeared again, the same star that had been seen in the Eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They'd arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the, children, the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshiped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod. So they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen and returned to their own country. After the scholars were, were gone, God's angel showed up again in Joseph's dream and commanded, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Stay until <clears throat> further notice. Herod is on the hunt for this child and he wants to kill him. Joseph obeyed, he got up, took the child and his mother under the cover of darkness. They were out of town and well on their way by the daylight. They lived in Egypt until Herod's death. This Egyptian exile fulfilled what Hosea had preached. I called my son out of Egypt. Later, when Herod died, God's angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Up, take the child and his mother and return to Israel. All those out to murder the child are dead. <clears throat> Joseph obeyed, he got up, took the child and his mother and re-entered Israel. When he heard though that Aquilius had succeeded his father, Herod as king in Judah, he was afraid to go there. But then Joseph was directed in a dream to go to the hills of Galilee. On arrival, he settled in the village of Nazareth. This move was a fulfillment of the prophetic words. He shall be called a Nazarene. It's beautiful. And uh, so now um, time and space is given to our sweet pastor, Jonathan, um, who leads with such compassion and grace and, um, and just centers us and grounds us um, in God and who God is and his words continually remind us that we're the beloved. So um, Jonathan, it's your time to, to just um, let the spirit, let the spirit move through you and um, bless us all. So be blessed everyone. Thank you, Mackenzie. Well, uh, once again, Happy New Year. And Malika, I'm so grateful for that prayer. I feel like you always pray in a way that's so prophetic and that just ushers us in somewhere, takes us exactly where we need to go. And Joel and Tosh certainly feel that way about your worship, that that's already taken me where I needed to be this morning. Um, today's text and really um, everything about this morning is oriented around this whole idea of epiphany. If you're not real familiar with this part of the church calendar, uh, this week we celebrate Epiphany, technically on Wednesday, but I wanted to kind of combine what the lectionary reading from this morning from Matthew along with the Epiphany reading for, uh, for Wednesday, kind of an anticipation. We also really, uh, the, today and next week are doing a little two week study on this idea of death and resurrection, which I feel like is especially kind of fascinating just to, to kind of pair a couple of these things together because uh, just to break this down for a second, epiphany is just a word for unveiling epiphany. It's like to, to, have, an, to have an appearance or a manifestation specifically in context of the story of the church we think about this story of the epiphany of these wise men, these foreigners um, who, as far as we can tell, were more or less astrologers. These were people who followed the stars. They followed the signs that were in the stars. They were not part of that covenant that God made to Abraham. They were not Jews. They were Gentiles. And so part of why we celebrate epiphany is that this is the moment where really for the first time, those outside the Jewish story that Hebrew tradition are coming awake to see Jesus. They're coming awake to this radical, shocking surprise in the story of God that is the manifestation of Jesus. They're coming to see, they come to see Jesus for who Jesus is. They have a moment of epiphany. They have a moment of revelation. And really all of that leads to the baptism of Jesus. And whenever we think about the baptism of Jesus, which we'll get more into next week, we're always going to be thinking a lot about death and resurrection. But the way I really wanted to frame it this week in particular is, and um, 
and I hope this doesn't feel odd. You know, it's like on the one hand, I feel like it feels so right to be talking about epiphany right after the first of the year because the whole idea of epiphany is so hopeful. We're coming into a new year and we're, our eyes are open to see God in ways that maybe we haven't seen God at work before. And we're open to that kind of newness of life. We're open to the surprise of the spirit to see God at work in ways that maybe we weren't able to perceive the work of God or of God's spirit at work before. And that's an amazing thing. But one of the reasons why I feel like it's so important that we talk about even epiphany, even we talk about these moments of illumination or these moments of revelation, because we have them, right? We've had plenty of moments, probably especially in this last year. I know Netflix has this new documentary I've watched yet, but it's a sort of mockumentary on uh, death to 2020. <laughs> so 2020 has definitely been a year for a lot of us think of where there's been plenty of disillusionment and a lot of just uh, discouragement and a lot of pain. But we have moments of, of clarity, don't we? We have moments where uh, maybe they're brief. Uh, some of you might have experienced that. I know I had a few of those moments over this Christmas season that for all the ways that, I don't know, like any time in my life, there can be a degree of chaos. I had these moments of stillness and quiet and just clarity where I felt like I was able to have some perspective on some things and felt like I was able to perceive something of the work of God in my life. And those moments are really, really beautiful. Like we live for those moments of epiphany. But even these moments of epiphany, if we really pay attention to what we're reading, even early in the Jesus story, this is long before there's a cross. This is long before, uh, I mean, I know we have like the poetry of Isaiah, but in terms of the Jesus narrative in the gospels, this is long before there's any talk of a cross. This is long before any kind of passion narrative or, well, really any of the other painful things that happened to Jesus and his followers in the story. Already from the very beginning, this epiphany, this revealing of who Jesus is, is sort of wrapped up with death happening all around. It's this, we already see something of this pattern of death and resurrection that just seems to be embedded in everything. Like you can't have one without the other. There is always, always, always both. So for example, in the text that McKinsey read so beautifully for us today. So we have this moment, right? Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. And we know, by the way, it's, incidentally, we think actually that this would be a couple years potentially after the birth of Jesus. So actually some time passes. But we have these wise men, we have, they're sort of mystics, they're sort of astrologers, uh, they're, who, who, who have this revelation, God appears to them through the stars, they follow the stars until they get to Jesus, they see Jesus for who he is. And yet it's right in the midst of all of this. Herod, the homicidal king, goes on a rampage and orders the death, the slaughter of the infants, so that all of these innocent children are killed, so that while the Christ child is being born into the world, there are a whole lot of other children. Mary is able to swaddle and to hold her baby, Jesus, but there are an awful lot of mothers who are grieving and crying in this exact moment, at the very same time that new life and hope and promise is coming into the world in such a profound way that we never could have expected, there's so much death that happens simultaneously. And it's not even just kind of happening uh, around Jesus in an indirect way. You know, it's like, you know, after, the, after these wise men leave, the angel shows up to Joseph in a dream and commands him to take the child, to take Mary, and to flee to Egypt. And I know there's like, there's a, there's kind of a prophetic text about this, but it seems counterintuitive because keep in mind that according to the, the story of God and the story of God's people, you know, this whole, this whole movement has been about getting out of Egypt. Egypt is the place of bondage. Egypt is the place of slavery. And yet, under duress, under pressure, there's actually a directive from the spirit. The angel tells, actually tells Joseph, go back to Egypt. 
go to the place of bondage, go to the place of slavery. I like, I, like I'm gonna keep you safe there for a little while. Um, and that's forced precisely because Herod's on this rampage. And then once again, note, I, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. It's when Herod dies, it's when Herod actually dies, when the king dies, that then Joseph will be given a word of instruction once again, that the angel will come to Joseph and then tell him to return to Israel. That's on the death of Herod. So we just see this pattern over and over again that it's always a story about how some things are dying, some people are dying, some people are being born. Some things are dying, other things are coming back to life. That pattern of death and resurrection is absolutely everywhere and in everything. I, I don't know, I, I don't think this is even, I started to say this is kind of an obsession of mine, but I don't think it's an obsession. I think there's something almost mathematical about it. Everywhere I see and in everything I see, all I'm seeing are stories of death and resurrection. It's how the universe works. It's how God runs the cosmos is through death and resurrection. Uh, I don't know anything about gardening. I don't know if Stephanie Tate is watching today, my dear friend. Uh, she knows more about gardening than I do, but I know gardening is all about death and resurrection. But it's always some things are dying and out of and and out of these dead things that go back into the soil, that new life comes out. I'm kind of weird about this too, because I feel like even in pop culture, like I'm just constantly mindful of, so this weekend I had a lot going on, but one epiphany that I had is um, Cobra Kai season three uh, came out on Friday and y'all just have to understand, there's something about the time in my life in which I watched the Karate Kid movies. I, Cobra Kai is like one of the few things in this world that I have like a pre-critical response to. I mean, like, I'm not able to evaluate it. I don't think about it. I just, I, I just become eight years old again. I love every second of it. Uh, I, I had to, basically, I finished the season in like a day. I didn't mean to do this, but you, you, you talk about binge watching. I mean, it's, it, but it's like that because, you know, it's like, and part of what I love about Cobra Kai, which is resurrecting this whole Karate Kid story, is you're revisiting these old characters. And I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. Johnny, who's the bad guy in the first Karate Kid movie, it centers around him and he's in like his, his mid fifties and he's an alcoholic and he's down and out. And now you're seeing the world from his perspective and now he's a sensei himself. And the way in which it, it just continues each season to bring in these old characters in the Karate Kid movies. And there's a kind of resurrection that's happening. And yet you're also seeing kind of the baton being passed. You've got these young students and this kind of new life. And I just, uh, I, I'm sure I'm perfectly weird about it. I'm watching Cobra Kai and thinking about the Karate Kid and I'm thinking about death and resurrection. I'm, I, mean, I, just, I just see it everywhere because there's really no great story in literature or film that's not ultimately a story of death and resurrection. All stories are stories of death and resurrection. Of death and resurrection. Like there's always going to be some element of you have to let something die in order to make room for something that's new. And I'm saying all that, friends, to say this. As we're into this new year, and it's a time to focus on new things, and it's a time to focus on new life. You know, I feel like so many of uh, in this past year, I feel like even when I preach hopeful sermons or try to say hopeful things. It always comes out so like, is that really gonna sound hopeful to anybody? I, I feel a little bit like the New Year Grinch to talk about death at all on January 3rd. But here's why I feel like it's so important to talk about death while we're in the beginning of the new year. If we're going to make way for new life, if we're going to make way for resurrection, there really is a way that we have to accept the reality of death. And that doesn't mean that we always um, by any means cooperate with death. One of the reasons that we're celebrating today, this 131 mile walk that five activists took on behalf of our friend Julius Jones is because we actually do believe that Christians are not supposed to cooperate with death in that way. Sometimes death is a principality to be resisted. 
And ultimately, man, I just felt God when I said that. I don't know if anybody else is preaching with me out there because I can't see anything from here. <laughs> but I just really, I, there is a very real way in which the heart of the Christian story is that de death is not our friend. Death is not an ally. Ultimately, death is an enemy to be overthrown. And what we have in the kingdom come, what we have in the end of the story is a time that comes when God wipes every tear from all of our eyes where there will be no more dying where there, there, there won't be constant cycle of death and resurrection. Ultimately, it's just life, life, and more life, and the God who makes all things new. But in this time, in this moment, we're not there yet. We're still in that bracket of in-between time where there still is death. And the thing I just really want to ask you this morning, as you're having your own epiphanies, as you're having, as God is trying to break through, as God is trying to reveal God's self to you. Because I believe this, some of you already, not because you just tuned in to watch this on Facebook or YouTube or wherever today, you, there's already ways that God is trying to reveal God's self to you and you know it. And there's things that you're seeing. There's some things that you've been trying to see with some clarity and, and, and you've got some perspective. But in order to step all the way into the new life, in order to step all the way into the resurrection, there's always some letting go that has to happen first. And you can't carry those things that are dead into that kind of new space. That doesn't mean that relationships can't be resurrected. That doesn't mean that people can't be resurrected. That doesn't mean that a kind of new life can't come. But do you see the difference? Um, I, you know, some of you heard me talk about this before, but I, I mean, it never leaves my mind for long. How in 2014, that which was such a stormy season in my own life, that my friend's father died. And shortly before he died, there was a season of a couple of weeks when he was on a ventilator and no brain activity, completely brain dead. And having the feeling, he was a big man like me, um, six, four, uh, about my size, maybe a little bigger, but African American. And I just, but I just remember holding his hands. And I just remember just the heat in his hands and the color in his cheeks and feeling like, just felt like he could, he could get up off that bed and give me a hug. But he was brain dead and he had been for weeks. And the family facing this decision of whether or not to take him off a ventilator and ultimately having to make the courageous decision, which is explicitly what he wanted to finally have to, and I don't use this phrase morbidly, to pull the plug, literally. And having this moment where the Holy Spirit dealt with me in such a, a deep way that I, that I was still the sort of person that would always choose resuscitation over resurrection. I would take the form of a thing. I would take the warm body. I would take like a, see, even if something, um, for God to resurrect something, it always has to take on a different form, right? So for example, the language that Paul will use in the New Testament, that if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are now becoming new. Well, we know for those of us who have had that kind of epiphany of becoming connected in Christ, we still have the same skin. We still have same many of the uh, same habits and tendencies. If you're an Enneagram person, maybe you're still the same Enneagram number, whatever. So there's some ways that you're very much still you, but you're you in a very different form. And that's what I'm saying, is that in order for new life to come, at minimum, the form of the old thing has to die. And it can't just be about trying to, uh, to just kind of cram some version of the old in, into, into this grid in some way. It can't be about just trying to put the thing on life support. There really has to be room for something entirely new and it's just the way that it works and i do, and i don't think it's um it's cruel uh because i don't think god is the one who's directly doing it i just think this is how again creation works it's how created things work as things are dying it's making space for something that is new so as we get ready to come to the table of jesus in just a couple moments pastor julie is going to lead us i just want to ask you this morning and as a kind of invitation what is it that you're seeing what is it that god is revealing how is god revealing god's self where is the epiphany where is the invitation right now for you to see and to hear 
how is it that even that invitation to new life might come wrapped up with some death around it, it where there's still some letting go that needs to happen, where there's still some yieldedness that needs to happen, where instead of trying to just kind of drag everything that has been and trying to drag everything that's old into this new reality, um, into this epiphany, into this awakening, where is there an invitation for there to be some letting go and to be some release so that, because that's what I find often, is that when we're not willing to really let go, then what happens is we kind of hold people and things around us hostage so that they're, we really don't give them the chance to be resurrected, do we? We assign expectations to people in such a way um, to where we kind of, uh, we, we kind of entomb them in our ideas about how they should be and how things should be. Whereas in this act of letting go, then we actually open ourselves up and we open them up for the risk of resurrection, that maybe something new could actually happen. So with that in view, I just wanna pray for you and then I'm gonna hand it over to Pastor Julie. But God, we thank you that you are a God who is always eager to be seen that you are not playing hide and seek with us. That you are not somehow looking for us to beg, but you wanna be seen. You are not hidden. And God, your ways are not hidden. The way of death and resurrection is not hidden. It's all around us. We just often do not have eyes to see it. So I pray today that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us even now. Help us to see ways in which the Christ is being born anew in us. Help us see the ways that you're bringing new life around us. Help us also to recognize that death is also a part of life. And help us to recognize, God, where it is that we need to both accept death and where we need to resist it where we need to let go in a way that makes room for resurrection. Help us to trust the things that you show us. We've seen a lot of things with our eyes and heard a lot of things with our ears in this day that even um, we know that so much media is, uh, can be easily manipulated. But I pray for a different kind of seeing where we will trust this vision, that we will trust this appearance, that we will trust the truth and the goodness and the beauty of the way that you were revealing yourself to us and the way you will reveal your goodness to us, even the people around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Pastor Julie, would you lead us? Thank you, Jonathan. That was such a good word. And it just... Um... It just reminds me how important the practices such as the table keep us grounded in those spiritual patterns such as death and resurrection. And so today it makes it special as we come together this first Sunday of the new year and together we are going to practice the table and take communion together. So I want to encourage you wherever you're at to grab um, some kind of element, whether it be bread, Tostitos, wine, whatever you have, we just believe that God is going to con consecrate that in this practice today. And so let us come together and say the prayer that Jesus has instructed us to pray. Our Father, Mother, Creator, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And now we'd like to confess our sins. And you know, it's important that we have an appropriate view of confession, um, you know, Pride tells us that we have no need of change, and condemnation tells us that we are not worthy of redemption, but confession helps keep us grounded, because regardless of our intentions or our actions, all of us need to be calibrated with love. So this practice of confession allows us to align ourselves with love once again. 
So let's confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess the sins sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. And now hear my words, not as me or in any authority that I carry, but as the words of our creator, God, you are forgiven, you are whole, you are worthy of love and belonging in this beloved community of saints. And now let's prof profess the creed that has been repeated for centuries by the predecessors of our faith. I believe in God, the almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Virgin Mary, I mean, by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the, li the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And now join in this invitation with me. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have not been here often and you who have not been, who you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a very long time, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come not because it is I who invite you, it is our Lord, it is his will that those who want him should meet him here. And now I want to invite you to take the elements as we recite the text from the night that Jesus sat at the table with his friends and showed us the pattern of this practice of the table. On the night he was betrayed, he said the blessing and broke the bread with his friends and said, this is my body, which is given for you in remembrance of me. So now you can take the bread and eat. And after supper, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whether you drink it, whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So take the cup and drink. And now let us declare the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And now let's just pray for a minute. Creator God, I just pray that you will consecrate these actions, this practice today. May it bring freedom to our souls and our bodies, and may it anchor us to the love that has been handed down to us across time and generations. In your name we pray. Amen. And now I'm going to pass this on to Lance, who's going to be closing us out this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glowing like an angel at the top of the tree. So let me see if I can change this. Anyways, well, it's not going to work because the sun isn't going to move for me. But anyways, we're so glad to be back together after our week of rest last week. We pray that whatever holiday you celebrated last week, um, and that your New Year's was great, that it was safe, that it was refreshing. We're really looking forward to kicking off this new year together. We're excited for what this year is going to bring. I want to thank Joel and Tosh, as always, for leading us in their beautiful music. You can follow them on Spotify, Jonathan and Mackenzie for bringing us the scripture and liturgy, and Malika for the wonderful prophetic prayer and to Julie for leading us in the beautiful liturgy, which is so refreshing to be back together. We're really excited. We do have a couple announcements before I close us out with the benediction. 
So just a heads up to put it on your calendars, we are going to have our first pub theology of 2021 on January 20th. It will be via Zoom. Um, we might cast that to Facebook too. Uh, it'll be on, um, yeah, on January 20th at 7 p.m. The, uh, the topic is TBD. And um, <clears throat> then also our justice initiative for this week is like Malika talked about um, is going to be for justice for Julius. And there's some things that we can all do to, um, you know, to support that initiative. Can y'all see me now? Okay, cool. So anyways, there are a few things that we can all do to make sure that we're supporting that initiative. You can go to justiceforjuliusjones.com. And if you scroll down toward the bottom of the page, um, there's three actions that they say that you can help with right now. The first one is to download the social media toolkit. It's just a bunch of graphics and some wording that you can use to promote Justice for Julius's campaign on Facebook or any of your social medias. The second one is if you haven't already to sign the petition online to get his clemency petition before the governor. And um, if you do that, that's a really great and easy way. It only takes like one or two seconds to just hit the button and it automatically populates it for you and sends it to the appropriate people. And the third one is to send an email to the parole board. Again, you can go to justiceforjuliusjones.com and find all the ways that we can get involved for this wonderful thing. And as Jonathan talked about, Christians are followers of Jesus and Jesus is certainly not a friend of death. So as we close out this service, I wanna leave you guys with this new year's benediction. This, this new year, would you know deep inside your bones that God is with you, for you, and in you? This new year, would you know how kind and loving, faithful, gracious, and present God is for you through Jesus the Messiah? This new year, would you know that any hardship that you will face is met with the intercession of Jesus, who sits in heaven and ever lives to pray for you? making all things new. This new year, would any good endeavor you might dream of be God's grace and favor with that? And this year, would you know and believe and experience the fact that God's grace is not an abstract notion, but it is his loving power to meet each and every one of your needs, each and every second, minute, hour, day, week, and month of 2021. And now I leave you with this benediction from the author of Hebrews. May the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good thing that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, we guys, guys, we love you. We're so thankful that you're with us. Just uh, if you're not on Slack, I will leave you with this. Um, I noticed that there were some new faces on our Facebook Live. If you want to get more connected with the table community, uh, you can message us on Facebook or Instagram and we'll add you to the Slack. That's how we get uh, we're all instant notifications and we just talk to each other on there because we, you know, we're a, a close knit community. And if you want to be more involved, go ahead and message us and we'll add you to the Slack. Other than that, we love you. Have a great week, guys.